Yes, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr. Moore. Mr. Rich will be leading his evidence. Yes, Mr. Moore, could I just trouble you to stand a moment while I ask you Burden. first whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an oath. affirmation? An oath, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Can we swear the witness, please? Yep, certainly. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Will be the truth. The, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. Moore, do sit down. Yeah. What is your full name? Uh, Nicholas William Moore. And what is your business address, Mr. Moore? Uh, 50 uh, Martin Place, Sydney. Are you attending this commission in response to a summons? Uh, yes, I am. Do you have that summons with you, Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, I do. Commissioner, I tender the summons to Mr. Moore. Exhibit 7.59, the summons to Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Moore, have you signed two statements in response to requests from the Commission? Yes, I have. Um, do you have both of those statements with you? I do. Is one of those statements headed rubric 7-06 and dated 19 November 2018? Yes, it is. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, it, they are. I tend to that statement, Commissioner, which has been given the ID number MGL 0043 0005 0001. That statement concerning rubric 7-06 becomes exhibit 7.60. I also tend to the exhibits to that statement, Mr Commissioner, subject to non-publication direction 419 that those you made on the 14th of November. Those can form part of the exhibit, yes. Mr Moore, is the second of your statements headed rubric 7-16 and dated 19 November 2018? Uh, yes, it is. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. I tend to that statement, which has been given the ID number MGL 0043 0005 0042. That statement and its exhibits in relation to rubric 7-16 becomes exhibit 7.61. That pleases the Commission. Thank, Thank you, you Commissioner. Much. Thank you very much, Mr Rich. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Moore, you've been the Managing Director and CEO of Macquarie Group Limited since 2008. That's right. And you started at Macquarie in 1986. That's correct. You will be finishing as Managing Director and CEO at the end of next week? That's correct. And so by the time you finish with Macquarie, you'll have been there for 32 years? A little bit more, but yes, that's correct. And is that length of tenure at Macquarie usual or unusual for the institution? For the senior members of the Executive Committee, it's not unique. We have a number of other senior executives with a similar a period of service. And do you have <coughs> a view about how the longevity of senior executives at the company affects the culture of an organisation? Yes, I do. And what is your view? I think uh, certainly from our uh, viewpoint, we very much see the relationship between the employees and the shareholders as a long-term partnership and we are very focused on the long term. And therefore, if you have senior executives who are there at the company for a very long time, their interests, their long-term interests align with the shareholders' interests and the customers' interests? That's correct. One of the points you make in your statement is that you are reluctant to make some general comments outside of the confines of Macquarie and your point is your effectively your professional experience is confined to the Macquarie group. That's, that's correct. What I want to try to do then is to first just try to tease out some of the differences between Macquarie and some of the other institutions that we've been looking at and so I want to do two things. First deal with the nature of Macquarie's business mm -hmm. and second, deal with the enforceable undertaking that was given by Macquarie Equities mm -hmm. Limited and then we'll move to some other topics. Macquarie, I think you say in your statement, opened its doors in 1969. That's correct. 
And as at 31 March 2018, it's operating in over 25 countries. That's right. It has a market capitalisation of $39 billion. Yep. That's I'm sorry. That's correct. Consolidated net assets of approximately $18.2 billion. Correct. And assets under management of just shy of $500 billion. Yes, correct. It's a little bit more than that now, but yes. And the business of Macquarie, of Macquarie Group has five divisions. That's correct. One of those divisions is the Banking and Financial Services Division. That's correct. And that would seem to be the division most comparable to some of the other institutions that we've been dealing with. That's correct. And within that Banking and Financial Services Division, you offer personal banking, wealth management and business banking. That's right. And it may be helpful just to put this in the context of the rest of the Macquarie business, if we bring up your statement in response to rubric 7-06, so that statement should be mgl.0043.0005.0001, and if we go to page 3 of that statement, and this is figure 2, where you've broken down the five divisions and their respective Australian and New Zealand and international income. Mm -hmm. And we gather the point you're making in this figure is that for the other four divisions, they a much higher percentage of their income comes from overseas compared to Australia. That is correct. And also, and this will become more apparent if we then go over to page four and look at figure three. If we just blow up figure three, we see that the contribution of that banking and financial services group to Macquarie Group's operating revenue and income is only 15% of operating income and 11% of net profit contribution. That is correct. And I, I, I should just point out, though, we have within our CAF division, there is an, a car leasing division as well. That that's is your an capital Australian asset finance. Yes, Capital that's asset right. finance, yes. Corporate asset finance. I'm sorry, corporate asset finance. And within the... Banking and Financial Services Division sits Macquarie Equities Limited? Correct. And you make a point in your statement, which is Macquarie, Macquarie Equities advice business contributed 0.5% of Macquarie's profit in the 2013 year? In net profit, that's correct. Net profit. And how does that compare to its current level of contribution? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a lot larger today. It would be larger, but, but not a lot. And what is the strategic value of Macquarie Equities advice business to the Macquarie Group? When we first uh, acquired the broker, we, uh, taking a step back, the, 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 it, it, the business was a stock retail stockbroking business, largely. It was built by buying a range of retail brokers around the country. And part of the thinking, part of the rationale back in the 90s when we acquired these brokers is it would be a good support for our wholesale equity capital markets business. So in the equity capital markets business, we underwrite capital raisings for companies and we then distribute it. And the view is that we had something to add to the retail market by being able to provide uh, these sorts of issues to the market. So if you think about the competitors to the Macquarie Equities advice business, given that it's come out of those types of stockbroking routes, who would the major competitors be? Well, it would be the smaller... Um, but it, it's changed over the while. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's been a evolving story, obviously. So, so there was a period where most of the international investment banks would have had a retail offering 
of some sort. Now, many of those have stepped back in recent years from that. So some would have them and some wouldn't. So I, I really couldn't give you a, an accurate uh, answer on that today. I understand. The, the point, though, I, I think where this goes is to say Macquarie is not a retail bank that has then acquired a wealth management division. Macquarie is an investment bank that has acquired a stockbroking arm. That's right, largely. And what happened in 2012 was that ASIC identified some advice, misconduct and cultural failings at Macquarie Private Wealth. That's right. We entered into an enforceable undertaking with them. After ASIC had conducted some surveillance and identified issues? Yes. And you've explained at paragraph 12 of your statement 7-16 that the concerns included the effectiveness of Macquarie Equities licensee risk policies, processes, controls and systems? Yes, that's correct. Compliance with obligations regarding the provision of personal advice? That's correct whether representative conduct had been dealt with consistently and appropriately? That's correct. The adequacy of record keeping? That's correct. The effectiveness of monitoring and supervision? That's correct. Whether compliance training and education had taken place? That's correct. The identification, recording, assessment and reporting of breaches? Yes. You can see that there now. And yep. whether... Macquarie Equities management had failed to foster and maintain a proper commitment to and culture of compliance? That's correct. Now, initially, when ASIC raised the issues or these concerns, did they, I'm sorry, withdraw that. When ASIC raised these issues and concerns and before the EU was entered into, were they brought all the way up to the attention of you and the board of Macquarie Group? Yes. What we heard from the business that ASIC was reviewing the operations of the business from the business, so the business advised us of that. Uh, then there was a, um, a meeting, as I recall, with our central uh, compliance and uh, uh, chief legal counsel with ASIC who went through their statement in terms of their view of the shortcomings of the business. And do you recall whether there was an initial reluctance to accept ASIC's conclusions that there were fundamental problems in the business? I think there was, there was questioning. There was questioning. Was that questioning by the business or questioning by you and the board? There was questioning by the business which resulted in us having the central functions directly review the situation by, I think, spending a weekend going through the files and the, and the evidence that was being uh, discussed. And the central function is what? Uh, legal and compliance. Legal within Macquarie Group rather than within Macquarie Equities. That's, good. That's correct. And was the view initially of the business that ASIC just didn't understand the business? I think, the, as I recall, the, the view from the business was there is an evolution taking place across the market and, and the business was part of it, where firms were moving from a traditional stockbroking world into, into a modern world of providing independent financial advice and that the systems, they had put in place systems, they had put in place training, and they, that was transforming the nature of the, of the brokers into independent financial advisors. And it was a, um, an evolution taking place across the market and that we were, in the business's mind, they were leading, they were one of the leaders in terms of that development in the marketplace. And what happened after the central, centralised function reviewed the business? They spent a weekend reviewing the files and they came back and reported that they thought there were, there were issues here. And so we um, engaged with ASIC seeking, the, um, seeking the, uh, to discuss the enforceable undertaking. And you've presumably considered then and have considered now what the root causes were of yes. the issues with the business. Yep. And in your statement you identify two root causes. Can you explain what, in your view, was the first of those causes? 
Well, the first is along the lines um, you've raised already that there was an evolution taking place from a, um, a retail stockbroking business, which had a, a relatively limited focus, to a, um, an advice business. So that evolution was, was taking place. It was the rate of that evolution and the need for that evolution to happen uh, faster than it did. Now, the, the failing in the business is that we didn't recognise, the business didn't recognise that they weren't, they, they weren't provide, they hadn't moved the business as fast as they were required to do it. So within the business, they didn't see that and, and, and thus we ended up where we were. And is one of the issues that became apparent that, at least within Macquarie Equities Limited, there was a cultural difference between those who were stockbrokers and had come out of the stockbroker model and those who the smaller number of financial planners within the business? Perhaps, but I, I don't think that was the main cause. The main cause, I think, was just a lack of recognition of the issue, that people understood there was a change necessary. They thought they were engaged in making the change take place, they just didn't realise the urgency and the importance of actually delivering on that. So I think there was a, a failure of recognition by management of, of the situation that we faced. And what was the second root cause? Well, the second, well, one is, is, is management. Secondly, the, from a structural viewpoint, we had compliance reporting into the business itself. And that was a, a failure of design, that compliance should be independent of the business so it can actually provide a, a challenge to the business of the way the business thinks about the world and the requirements they need to meet. Now, the ways in which those things were addressed were under the EU, Macquarie Equities was required to conduct an assessment of its licensee risk framework? That's correct. And what was the purpose, as you understood it, of assessing the licensee risk framework? To determine the risks that we had in the business by its very nature and to see what we had in place to manage those risks and to identify the deficiencies between the risks that were there and the controls we had around those risks. And I think consistent with some of the points you've been sp speaking about, when those issues were, as when the initial assessment occurred, it showed a number of problems in relation to risk, where there were risks that were very high and where the controls were weak. That is correct. And it, it may be helpful if we bring those up. Can we bring up Exhibit NM-04, Tab 2, to the statement, which is 7-16, and the relevant pages we want to go to are dot zero one one nine the initial doc ID is MGL dot triple zero one dot triple zero two dot zero one zero five So this is the licensee risk framework assessment that was conducted in April of 2013 as required by the EU. So I believe. And if we go to page dot zero one one nine. We can see the summary of the high level assessment results setting out the various types of issues that have been identified the risk being advisors do not provide financial advice in a compliant manner, that advisors provide advice which is inappropriate, advisors provide financial services to clients without the express instruction of the client, etc. That's correct. And Macquarie also engaged Deloitte in order to undertake a risk culture review? That's correct. And that report also painted a concerning picture about the risk within the business. The risk culture, correct. And in your view, what did it show fundamentally about the risk culture within Macquarie Equities Limited? 
Well, there are a number of findings in the report. And these, I mean, I wasn't a direct recipient of the reports, but the, um, the story, I don't know if you are going to bring it up, but it's, it's a pretty clear story of a, um, a lack of control, uh, a lack of challenge. Uh, I think one of the expressions used is um, freedom without boundaries, uh, that general nature of a, uh, an environment. And the consequence then, having done this licensee risk, licensee risk framework assessment and also having the Deloitte report in relation to risk, was that Macquarie then went about attempting to make a number of changes in relation to the risk culture within that business? Sure. And some of those changes were structural changes? That's right. Uh, they were fundamental changes to... Uh, not just the culture, but, it, but the, the, all elements of the organisation. Uh, we changed the management, obviously, of the organisation. <coughs> Pardon me. We changed uh, compliance reporting. We made it report uh, centrally. Uh, we embarked on a whole range of new systems, processes and procedures in terms of how uh, the business managed itself. And, of course, as part of the EU, we um, s sought to compensate any clients who may have suffered. And I think in your in your statement you summarise those changes as having, or there being three key changes. The first one you identify is the replacement of individuals within management within the business. That's correct, as I said, changing management, correct. And is it your view that the approach to risk being demonstrated by those individuals was different and outside of appetite compared to the approach to risk that, say, is demonstrated at the senior executive level within Macquarie Group? Well, we have no appetite for businesses failing to meet their regulatory requirements. And the response then in terms of consequences was, in a broad sense, you removed a number of individuals? That's correct. You let them go? That's correct. And specifically in relation to remuneration, and we'll come back to this in a moment, there, were, there was a remuneration consequence for the senior executive within the business? That's correct. And it may be that it'll be easier if we come back to that when we're talking about the particular way that Macquarie Certainly. deals with that, but in a broad sense, the amount of variable remuneration that that executive received in 2013 compared to 2012 halved in terms of profit share? Different levels of executives. The, the, the person responsible for this business specifically obviously uh, lost their job. Yes. But the senior executive within... That, that is correct. Right. That is the person who suffered the halving of the that profit share. And is the reason why changing the senior executives makes a difference because ultimately it's the most senior people within the business who have to set the tone from the top? That's correct, but it's, it wasn't just the senior people. Obviously, there was changes taking place throughout the organisation to reflect the changes that we needed. I understand. One of the other things that you did was to remove not just senior executives within that particular business, but you also removed advisors that when you reviewed their files, you considered that they'd engaged in some sort of unacceptable conduct. Advisors, managers, reviewers, people in the compliance function. And is it by, in your view, by removing those people, by showing that there are definitive consequences for stepping outside of Macquarie's risk appetite, that you set the cultural tone within the organisation? Certainly. And that then therefore creates the norms of behaviour within the organisation? As part of it. There's a whole consequence management uh, is important across all the businesses at all time. So it's not just people losing their jobs, it's people having um, pay consequences, as you say, uh, promotion consequences, there's a whole range of different consequences that can follow. 
That's right. But they are individual, they are consequences for individuals as a result of the conduct that they've been involved in. That's right. And also the conduct that has happened on their watch in the sense that you make the point, the manager who was directly involved in the business lost their job, but the more senior executive responsible for that part of the business also suffered a pay consequence. That's correct. And showing those consequences from Macquarie's perspective is part of, to use a word that seems to have become very fashionable, embedding norms of behaviour within the business. Uh, correct. We have um, one of our key tenants is the idea of accountability, the key principles in terms of how we run our business. And what does that mean exactly? It's, we say to every person in the business they're accountable for the outcomes uh, that they deliver, particularly for business managers. So every business manager is accountable for all the outcomes of the business. And so that's a uh, all the outcomes, financial outcomes, conduct outcomes, regulatory outcomes, client outcomes, all the outcomes. The second change or significant change that you pointed to was a change to the reporting lines within the compliance division? That's correct. And was that about shifting over to reporting from BFS into the group level risk management group? That's correct. And how did you expect and how has that affected the approach to risk within the business? Well, it's fundamental for the second line of defence that you have an independent risk function. So uh, one of our key um, structures from a risk management viewpoint is to ensure we have an independent risk management group that does review issues such as compliance. And the third change that you refer to was that in general there was an introduction of a material number of training programs, policies, processes and systems to address the compliance concerns identified by ASIC? Correct. And presumably that means incurring a cost in order to develop those programs and implement those processes? Certainly. And the view of Macquarie was it was to make the business do what you wanted to do, you had to incur that cost. That was a necessary part of it. That is correct. And I think there are then some more specific changes that were made, but they've been dealt with by Ms Weber, so your, your awareness of them is effectively just what Ms Weber has told you about them. Exactly right. All right. And do you have a view about the effect of ASIC's engagement with the implementation of the EU? I think it was effective. And how exactly, you may not know, but how exactly was ASIC engaging with Macquarie during the two-year period in relation to the implementation? I don't know directly, as you say, I wasn't engaged in that engagement, but I do know there were regular meetings between the, the group head um, Greg Ward, who stepped up to take on the role of the uh, enforceable undertaking as well as subsequently running the group, regular uh, meetings uh, at the highest level uh, with, with ASIC as well as throughout the, the teams involved at Macquarie, uh, at KPMG and uh, at ASIC itself. The Closure of a report, I think, was delivered in about 2015. Yes. And the closure report said that there had been a significant improvement in advisor compliance grades and quality of client records, and the improvements are embedded and sustainable. Correct. The outcome, though, wasn't that things stopped at that point. Macquarie Equities then engaged KPMG to complete some further work and can you just explain to the Commissioner what the nature of that further work was? Well it wasn't, I personally wasn't engaging, uh, engaged with the discussion but the, uh, the documents I think that are part of the uh, statement uh, talk about the ongoing need to embed the changes and to review 12 months after the event that the changes had taken place. And so then there was a further report 
delivered, I think, in 2016 from KPMG talking about what the outcomes... A transformed business. Had, ...of it had been, which, as you say, concluded the business had been transformed in terms of its approach to risk. And do you have a view now as to where Macquarie Equities is at in its dealing with risk, its culture of risk and its compliance? My understanding is it's, um, it's, it's, it is fully compliant. Uh, we have um, recently an internal audit report that was positive. It had two medium issues that were identified and have been resolved. We have our normal staff survey results that came through looking at the risk mindset of the group and uh, very strong results coming through in terms of the risk mindset of the people within the division. And when you reflect on it, what do you think would have happened if ASIC hadn't tapped Macquarie on the shoulder? It's a, a good question. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it was, as you suggest, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it was, a, it, was a, it was fortunate that it was brought to our attention so we could take the steps we did. If these types of problems arose in a business within the Macquarie Group now, do you think they would? It's possible that they could be identified and addressed without the need for asset. Absolutely, absolutely. As, as as we said before, the failing was at the um, at not having an appropriate second line of defence. Um, given it reported into the the business, sadly, it was not sufficiently objective to see the weaknesses. Uh, we do have a very clear second line of defence now across Macquarie, so we would expect our risk management group would detect any failings. We've got a third line of defence, of course, as well, being internal audit that hopefully would pick up an external any failings that weren't picked up through the second line. I want to move now, Mr Moore, to a different topic, which is in relation to grandfathered commissions. In July of this year, Macquarie Equities announced that it would cease the payment of grandfathered commissions. You're aware of that? Yes. And that decision, you explain in your statement, was made by Greg Ward? That's correct. And Mr Ward's role was, is what? He's the Group Head of Banking and Financial Services. And that wasn't a matter that needed to be considered by the board of Macquarie's group? No, that's a it's, a it's a business decision for that group. And you've said in your statement you agree with Mr Ward about why it's in the client's interests to remove grandfather commissions? Yes. And you may not have a view about this because this may be a business issue, but do you know what sort of time period it would require under Macquarie Systems to remove all grandfathered commissions? No, I'm afraid I can't answer that today. Thank you. I want to then move to another topic which is concerned with remuneration. I want to deal with two issues. The first is variable remuneration within the Macquarie business and the second is remuneration of brokers, which is something I think you know Macquarie has addressed in its submissions on the interim report? Yes. In relation to executive remuneration, the way in which Macquarie executives are paid, in fact, perhaps effectively all Macquarie employees are paid, is quite different from the way in which employees and executives within the retail banks we've been dealing with are paid, as I'm sure you know. Yes. And Macquarie has a... Or employees at Macquarie have a relatively low fixed salary? That's correct, at a senior level, that's correct. And can you explain to the Commissioner, at what level is it fixed? What is the purpose that is attempted to be achieved by the particular level at which it's fixed? It depends upon the, the role and the person. Um, so it does vary 
role by role, and uh, as you suggest, at a junior level, it's 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 higher than at a senior level. At a senior level, it more reflects the underlying performance of the business. So the way the the, the profit sharing system is set up is a sharing of the profits between the staff and the shareholders, and it and the and the variability increases the more senior you are in the organisation. With risk functions, central functions, that variability is less for obvious reasons. And so, for example, when it comes to the way in which you are remunerated, you're paid a fixed salary of something in the order of $800,000, a bit more, but then you receive a substantial profit share that's deferred over a number of years? That's correct. And if we were to, to attempt to compare it to the way in which the CEO of one of the retail banks is paid, really they're entirely different systems of pay. There's no, there's no fixed relationship between the maximum amount of variable remuneration that you can receive and the fixed salary that you receive. I believe our system is unique. And in fact, there's, I think one of the points you make in the statement is we asked, we asked all entities some relatively standard questions, like what is the maximum amount of variable remuneration that you can be paid? And Macquarie's response is there is no maximum amount of variable remuneration that, that is correct. Paid. And what is the maximum percentage compared to the fixed base salary? And the answer is there is no maximum percentage that there is no relationship whatsoever between the fixed salary and that is correct. the variable remuneration. And the variable remuneration then for senior executives is set each year as a percentage of profit share. That's correct. And the way in which that occurs is fixed is by taking into account four factors. That's correct. And the first of those factors is financial performance. That's correct. The second of those factors is risk management and compliance. That's correct. The third of those factors is business leadership, including client outcomes. Client outcomes. That's correct. And the fourth of those factors is people leadership and professional conduct consistent with Macquarie's code of conduct and what we stand for. That is correct. And Do we take it that's it's not a it's not a measurement process of trying to say it's twenty five percent for financial performance, twenty five percent for risk management, etc. That is correct. It's a process of effectively intuitive synthesis of considering all of those factors together and then it is arriving at a value. That is correct. But the reference, Mr. Moore, is to the process of fixing a sentence for crime. <laughs> right. Intuitive synthesis comes from that right. realm of discourse. You should thank, know thank, where, thank, what it's thank, thank you, Commissioner. I was uh, impressed with the phrase. I didn't know where it came from. So thank you for that. Fixing sentences. <laughs> and the point, though, I think that you try to make in your statement in relation to remuneration is that the emphasis upon risk management and compliance and business leadership and pe people leadership and professional conduct is not just, it's not just something in name only. It actually matters when it comes to that process of synthesis. Absolutely correct. And to take the example, we might bring this up, of the executive who suffered consequences as a result of the issues that led to the EU. If we bring up MGL.0043.0005.0005, which is the statement in response to rubric 7-06, and go to page.0019, We, we see in paragraph 71, you explain that the group head of banking and financial services at the time that Macquarie Equities entered into the EU was a relevant senior executive. That means they were subject to the 
types of performance-based pay that we've been talking about. That's correct. And notwithstanding that the net profit contribution of the BFS operating group for the year ending 31 March 2013 was 22% higher than compared to the preceding year, that group head's profit share allocation was halved. That's correct. And therefore, that's a consequence not of intuitively or only focusing on financial performance. It's factoring in and taking into account all of these considerations. Correct. And was that a decision that you had to make personally? I was involved in the decision making. I made a recommendation to the Board Remuneration Committee. And they accepted it? They did. With discussion. Sorry, did you say with discussion? Yes, we discussed these matters. I see. And do you think that this approach of within Macquarie of there actually being remuneration consequences for senior executives where there is conduct outside of risk appetite, which would include any misconduct, is something that then affects the culture of the organisation? Certainly, absolutely. Because they would understand that there are actually direct consequences of doing so. Yes. And one of the other features of the Macquarie model in relation to pay is significantly deferred remuneration. That is, that's correct. And I may get this wrong, but you're, you have the most, as the CEO, the most extreme model or the most extreme rules, which are that 80% of your variable remuneration gets deferred. That's correct. And it gets deferred to years four to seven after the period when it's allocated? I'm yes. sorry, three to seven. It, it, different elements, but yes, but broadly. And the consequence then presumably is that, in Macquarie's view, accentuates the focus upon the long-term outcomes of decisions. That's, that's the intention, long-term alignment in terms of the outcome for the shareholders and the clients and the remuneration. I want to move then to a different Before element. Before you do, yes. I understand the, uh, the remuneration system is unique to Macquarie and it has been tailored for Macquarie and its businesses. Uh, what, if anything, uh, is... Uh, generalisable from the Macquarie experience? Are there either principles or elements of the remuneration model uh, that Macquarie adopts that you think uh, yield more generalisable ideas? I think the uh, idea of profit, um, a profit share, is more powerful than bonus. Bonuses often relate to revenue rather than bottom line outcomes. A deferral, I think, is very important. I think deferral uh, to see the outcome of decisions being made. In finance, as we know, uh, decisions being made today have consequences over many years. And so making sure there is that alignment over a period of time, I think, is, is very important. So, uh, And the third element, as we're talking about, it's not just being driven off a financial metric. It has a broader application to all the other elements that are critically important to the success of an organisation, to the success of clients. Does the requirement to, uh, to synthesise a number of uh, factors, some of which are incapable of reduction to uh, numbers, uh, yield decisions that are sometimes difficult to explain or difficult to have accepted by those to whom they're applied? Are, are there issues about that emerge then in the management of the system uh, with the <coughs> staff understanding and those below understanding what's happening? I think there, there will be no natural pushback, but I think as coming back to the point about the longevity in terms of people in the organisation, 
they do understand the importance of it and they do you know mostly accept the outcomes and they they might debate them but in my experience is people accept the outcomes what sorts of explanation are they given for the outcome a very clear explanation the we have a with people who have been with you for a period of time, there's a precedent in terms of what they have seen in prior years. And if the events in the current year are different, you talk about those events in the current year. There's a financial result, you talk about the events, and you talk about why the events should be having a consequence. And it's a very open discussion. A recurring theme through these aspects of the discussion has been uh, the retention uh, of uh, executives and the longevity of uh, engagement. Um, it appears that that's not uh, necessarily uh, a universal experience in some aspects of the industry. Uh, there seems to be a churn. As I said, our, our philosophy is very much this partnership one. We want people joining the organisation effectively to be committing for a a long period of time and we are set up on that basis where decisions we're taking it we will be living with and they'll be living with and that's I think throughout the organisation that's certainly our hope and expectation. But again is that uh, capable of generalisation? Uh, is, is it something to which entities generally in your view should be uh, tending? Well, I, I think we see it across a number of different sorts of organisations, uh, particularly in the private capital world where people have an interest in the underlying business. The, in, from a financial sector viewpoint, I think when you look at uh, a number of the larger international firms, they would have elements, very similar elements to what we're talking about uh, for the senior leadership team, where perhaps unique in having it go all the way through the organisation. And I think that's, you quite rightly ask for more junior people, how does this apply and how do, how do, they, how do they feel the connection with the underlying profitability and the underlying risk in the organisation. So this is why we have this key concept in terms of our organisation of accountability, that everybody in the organisation, no matter what role, have to actually feel they're accountable for the outcome that they deliver. And that consciousness, we think, is the, the greatest safeguard we have in terms of the long-term health of the organisation and the client outcomes. And that we're constantly reinforcing in terms of staff training and staff review, that idea of accountability. Thank you. Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Moore, the last topic that I wanted to move to then is in relation to mortgage brokers and broker remuneration and Macquarie's submission to the in response to the interim report raises this issue can we bring up pol.9100.0001.0987 and then if we go to page 0011 See section F dealing with the role of intermediaries. Now, I'm assuming you weren't personally involved in the preparation of this submission, Mr Moore? Uh, I have seen it, yes. And have you thought about and considered this issue of the role of mortgage brokers? Yes, I have. All right. So I just want to ask you some questions about that. Macquarie makes a couple of points. The first is in paragraph 32 that it was in the 1990s that Macquarie introduced mortgage securitisation to the Australian market and that then led to non-bank participants. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that then led to competition. That is competition that's occurring at the level of banks and non-bank lenders to provide mortgages. That's correct. And that competition is what drove down in at least in one view, drove down by 2.5% the interest rates that were being paid by consumers? That's correct. 
And then the second point, which is made in paragraph 33, is that that, couldn't, that competition couldn't have occurred without the mortgage broker distribution channel. That's correct. And it, the point that's made in 33 is that brokers and those sorts of intermediaries are particularly important to a lender like Macquarie. That's correct. Macquarie, as we'll see in a moment, has a very small share of the home mortgage market in That's Australia. Correct. And the point that is made by Macquarie is that it's not like the big four who have an extensive branch network. That's correct. And therefore, presumably where this goes is to say the mortgage brokers as the intermediate intermediated distribution channel offer a distribution service to Macquarie. That's correct. And that's a benefit to Macquarie, that is it it gets a service from the intermediated distribution channel. That's correct. And it allows Macquarie to be able to compete with much larger lenders who have a branch network. That's correct. And if we bring up then Figure four from your statement in response to 7-06 and go to mgl.0043.0005.0009. We see there you've, as part of your statement, set out a table which shows Macquarie Group's share of the domestic mortgages market. Yes. And at least as at August of 2018, it, it was about the eighth largest player in relation to mortgages. That's correct. But after the first four, the big four, everybody else has a much smaller share of the market. That's correct. And presumably does not have the same branch distribution network as the big four. And so from Macquarie's perspective, at the moment, it's paying commissions to mortgage brokers. That's correct. And that is a payment from the perspective of Macquarie in exchange for a service that the brokers are providing to Macquarie. That's correct. And that is as distinct from another issue which I'm sure you're aware of and that's raised from a number of perspectives, which is mortgage brokers also provide a service to the customers. That's correct. And this, in a sense, is probably no different to any other intermediated market, either whether you consider it a two-sided market or one participant particip playing upstream and downstream in two different markets. That is, That's correct. by the one activity, they provide a service to two different people. That's correct. And what I then want to understand is what is the concern that Macquarie has about how changing commissions might affect the ability of mortgage brokers to provide that service to the non-major lenders? Good question. The, we're dealing a little bit about potential regulation we don't know the shape of. And our general point is one of caution to say the, there can be unintended consequences of regulation. We are dependent upon this broker network for our, our business and, and we think, having regard to history, that the broker network does provide genuine competition and that genuine competition has reduced the cost uh, for all, all mortgages. So our nervousness would be regulation could severely hamper that uh, broker broker business and so we're so we're providing a a note of caution in terms of any thoughts about changing the regulatory structure that people think broadly about what the implications may be can i just try to tease two ideas out of that the first is there can often be a misguided impression that competition is happening between the mortgage brokers and the bank so that 
you would expect the mortgage or potentially expect the mortgage brokers to be offering a lower interest rate than the interest rate that's being offered by the bank. That you, I'm not putting that to you as true, but you understand that's an impression that people have. I, I would agree it, it should be very clear the role of the mortgage broker to the customer. Can I, I, I'm more for the moment just want to focus on the competition that's occurring because I think the point that you are making is that the competition isn't happening between the bank and the mortgage broker. The competition is happening between the banks and the mortgage broker allows Correct. smaller banks to be able to compete with bigger banks. Correct, and banks to compete but with banks. I That's mean, right. the large banks also, they're the largest user of the brokers, of course. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't really expect that the banks would be offering a lower interest rate through the mortgage broker distribution channel compared to their own origination channel. That is, over time, you would expect that whatever rate they're offering, whatever any individual bank is offering is going to be the same, whichever channel it comes through. Do you agree with that? I'd agree they have to meet the market and if the, if the broker will be sourcing um, offers and if, if banks aren't meeting the market, uh, they will not be receiving the business. So it's very simple in our circumstance. We need to meet the market if we are to do the business. Yes. I think it's the same even though the other financial services organisation, the other banks may be far larger than ours, uh, the need to meet the market uh, is, is consistent. And the point I'm trying to get at is there, it can be suggested that if there isn't a lower rate being offered by a mortgage broker compared to what is available by direct origination, that that therefore means that the broker is failing to do the broker's job. But that, I'm suggesting, is not necessarily the case, and I'm interested in your view about that. Not quite sure of the point. At the, the point of the, or the broker or the market more broadly is to be bringing to light the different offers which change. And it offers not just in terms of price, but terms and conditions, as we know, with long-term <coughs> commitments are often even more important. And showing people the way through these uh, situations, and it's not just the upfront price, but all the other circumstances around it is an, is an important function. So I, I, I see the broker providing a, a market role in terms of being able to provide the different offers, different offers to um, the client base. Different offers between banks as opposed to a different offer, some secret offer that's only available by a bank through a mortgage broker. Different offer between banks, I imagine, yes. and other providers of mortgage finance. And then the second point I want to try to understand is from the perspective of Macquarie, if it's not paying or if it's not able to pay commission, then the consequence is it, it's prohibited in one way from remunerating brokers for a service that the brokers are actually providing to the bank and that Macquarie sees value in. you agree with that? That's right. We have a direct to the market uh, outlet, but it would be about 10% of our total mortgage volume. And what do you think would be the consequence if Macquarie was prohibited from being able to pay mortgage brokers any commission or in fact make any payment to brokers and the brokers were only able to obtain remuneration by charging a fee for service to the customer? Uh, don't know, obviously we'd be speculating, but uh, superficially it would not be, it doesn't sound uh, as attractive as the as the current structure, but you know, I'm guessing here. Attractive to whom doesn't seem as attractive to whom. To the, um, I think the expression used is is the sticker shock of actually seeing sure. the upfront fee. Um, one of the other issues discussed, obviously, is whether fees should be upfront or 
over the life. Yeah. And our position is we would like it, coming back to the alignment point, to reflect the value being delivered, which is over the life of the uh, over the life of the loan. <laughs> so um, there is an issue, obviously, for if you have an, an offer without a, a, a broking fee versus with a broking fee, it makes a, a difference in the mind of the of the consumer. Economically, of course, the, the fee is is being born. Um, I don't have any further questions, Commissioner. Yes, is there anything arising, uh, Mr. Ritt? Nothing, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Moore. You may step down. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Hodge, where to from here? We adjourn, Commissioner, now until two. Until two p.m. Two p.m. Mr. Shipton. Mr. Shipton at two. Yes, very well. Two p.m.